Certainly it's good to see all of you here this evening. We have a good number with our, for our Wednesday night midweek Bible study. Sounds like the fellowship is enjoyable. It's the top of the hour, and we want to give uh, B.J. Clark as much time as, uh, as, as we can to present the lesson uh, this evening. I'll say more about him in just a moment. But uh, we wanted to, um, to update you. Probably most of you are getting these updates through Facebook or uh, the Connect text group. Uh, but uh, continuing to receive good news uh, for Tim Melson. And we received another one today that uh, he's actually breathing uh, well on his own. He's alert and talking. And so um, thank you for all of your prayers uh, over the, the last week or so. And uh, certainly we want to continue to remember Tim in our prayers and all of the family, Lynn and all of the family, those who are here and those who are in Korea uh, with him. But this is certainly good news and um, we want to continue to remember uh, him in our prayers. I'd also ask that uh, you pray with me. Uh, my great aunt, Joanne Gerganis, I guess she's 87 or 88 and she was uh, just taken to UAB in Birmingham for emergency gallbladder surgery. She's not been in good health in some time. And uh, now uh, this has happened this evening. She and her husband are the two that I traveled with uh, when I began traveling overseas to teach in 2011. So I'll mention these two uh, in our prayer in just a moment as we begin. But uh, we're so thankful to have B.J. Clark with us this evening. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, well, for a couple of reasons, it's the first summer series I've been able to attend, but I've been looking forward to uh, BJ uh, being here. He's just a great guy, a great preacher. He's been the director of the Memphis School of Preaching since 2015, since 2015. Uh, preached at uh, the South Haven congregation in that area for many years prior to that. Very active. Um, he says this is ending a two-week trip for him, being on the road, teaching in summer series and gospel meetings. Uh, you'll see his name uh, all over Brotherhood Lectureships, Freed Hardeman, Polishing the Pulpit, of course, Memphis, and other opportunities. So uh, most of you know him. If you listen to 106.9 GBN Radio, uh, you'll hear him on it quite often. I'm not sure everything that he does on GBN Radio, I should have asked, but I know he and Mike Hickson, who will be here two, year, two weeks from tonight, uh, I know that they, they work together uh, on a radio program, and that's the one that I hear most often. So we appreciate this good brother in Christ and all the work that he does in the brotherhood. They're training great preachers at Memphis. And I'll just say one of the things that I really appreciate about B.J. is who he is outside of the pulpit, been able to get to know him a little outside of the pulpit. And he's a great preacher in the pulpit, but he's a, a wonderful, humble man outside of the pulpit. And he's always been very kind to me. And I certainly appreciate that. Uh, we're going to turn it over to him in just a moment, but we'll have a prayer uh, for Tim and Joanne, and then we'll turn it over to BJ. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that brings us together this evening. Bless us as we study together. Bless our other classes and children as well. Father, we thank you so much for the continued and proved health of Tim Nelson. We pray that you'll uh, continue to bless him, that his body will be strong. Help his, uh, his good wife and his children and grandchildren and all who, uh, who are close to him, his friends and family, especially the church family here at Wood Avenue, uh, to find uh, comfort and joy in, in this news. We pray that he can continue to improve. We're thankful for the doctors who are in that area who were prepared uh, to help him in times like this. Father, we pray for Joanne that all will go well with her surgery uh, this evening and uh, that her body will be strong through it. Father, bless us as we study together. Bless BJ as he stands before us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm delighted to be here. I've driven by this place many, many times, but never had the privilege, to my recollection at least, of being inside of it. And so getting a chance to uh, make some connections with the faces inside here is a real encouragement to me. I wish you could meet my wife, Tish. Some of you have met her and know her well. She is uh, now started school. She's a sixth grade teacher in Hernando, Mississippi, so pray for her. And uh, she's doing well. Last year about this time is when we were told that she had a brain tumor and they removed it. 
and she has been taking treatment. She'll have four more for the rest of uh, 2023. And so far, all the scans are coming back clear, and we are encouraged. But your prayers make a difference. And so her name is Tish. And if you remember to pray for a Tish, that would be the greatest thing. Thank you for your kindness very, very much. Uh, you know it's coming. The Bible says it's coming for all of us. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after this comes the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. But after I die, then what? Is that the end of me? How do I know for sure that I truly will rise from the dead? There was a soldier that said to his family before he was shipped overseas to defend our country, he said, look, if I die in the service of my country and they ship my body back to the States, I'm pretty sure they're going to come to my gravesite and play the song, the military song, Taps, and maybe have the salute with the guns. But he said, really, if they're going to play a military song at my gravesite that would be the most accurate and most appropriate, ask them to play Reveille the getting up song, because I'm getting up from this place someday. But how do you know that? How do you know for a fact that when you die, you will truly rise from the dead? Have you ever seen someone raised from the dead? And if you've never actually seen it takes place, uh, what makes you think you're going to be the one that actually rises from the dead if you've never seen someone rise from the dead? I'm here to give us all great hope tonight because there is someone who did rise from the dead and he guarantees your resurrection and mine. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love telling the story about the young man that was a preacher who was preaching his first funeral. He was so nervous. He was really petrified, to be honest with you. He thought, I, I know what I'll do. I'll take my New Testament and I'll find any place where Jesus was in the vicinity of a funeral proceeding, and I'll see if he said anything, and that will be my text for my funeral sermon. And what he discovered is that as far as the recorded occasions where Jesus was near a funeral are concerned, he, he raised the victim. And he thought, there's my sermon. Jesus has so much power, he can raise the dead. Now, death is no respecter of persons. When I was a boy in high school, there was a kid that sat next to me on the bus every day. And then one day he wasn't there, and I had no explanation as to why. And the next day came, and he wasn't there, and then another day. And I knew something had to have gone wrong. And then I learned he'd been killed in a car wreck. And so will he rise from the dead? Will I rise from the dead when I die? Or is that the end of me? Am I dead all over like the little dog Rover? That's the question that we want to address tonight. And I'm so thankful that there are predictions of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, there's a veiled prediction in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. But for time's sake, I want to zoom in on one that's quoted by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2. Now, when he's preaching this great gospel sermon, he's quoting a number of Old Testament verses because even though you and I are not under the Old Testament for our law, it was written for our learning. And one thing we can learn is that Jesus Christ was never going to stay in the grave. In fact, Psalm 16 and verse 10 is quoted in Acts chapter 2 and you'll notice there in verse number 25 of Acts 2, David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Verse 27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus was never going to stay in the grave. Isaiah 53 says in verse 10, after describing his crucifixion, his days would be prolonged. 
And that means his resurrection would prolong his days after his passing. How important is the resurrection to your faith and mine? We have communion sets that oftentimes will have a cross on top of them, or crosses will sometimes adorn the decor of the Lord's table, or you'll see them in various places. And uh, the cross is so important. Without it, we can't be redeemed. But I think sometimes we may forget that there's something else beyond the cross that's every bit as important to your redemption and mine. And to illustrate it, the little boy asked his daddy, he said, Daddy, tell me how Jesus died. His father thought he could handle the, the truth, and so he, he told the young man exactly how Jesus was put to death. And after telling him so, he noticed his son just kept crying softly. And he said, son, what, what part of the story that I just told you is making you cry the most right now? And his son sobbing silently, softly, and said, well, I guess if Jesus is dead, I can't sing Jesus loves me anymore. Oh, son, I forgot to tell you the best part. Yes, they did kill Jesus, and they killed him in just the fashion that I described. But he didn't stay dead. He arose. He arose. He, he was able to conquer death and conquer the grave. And so he arose, and then he ascended, and he went back to be with his father. And someday, we can go and be there too. And so this is a very important part of the teaching of Scripture. No wonder Jesus often talked about his resurrection. I would invite your attention to Matthew. I'll make it Mark for time's sake. Go to Mark chapter 8, if you will, please. And look at verse 31. Mark chapter 8 and verse number 31 where the Bible tells us that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must, not maybe, no, he must. He must suffer many things, be rejected of the elders of the chief priests and scribes, and be killed. And if he'd stopped there, what a sad story that would be. But it's got a hope attached to it. And after three days arise again. That is what my Bible teaches in Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. You remember on another occasion in John chapter 2, Jesus said, in three days, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And they were confused to think that he was talking about the physical structure of the temple. Later after his resurrection, they understood, oh, wait a minute. He's talking about the temple of his body. He predicted that he would rise from the dead on the third day. As a matter of fact, he made numerous predictions about his resurrection and the three days that he would spend in the grave before he would rise. And then the Apostle Paul piggybacks right on that very important concept. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is what Paul wrote in verse number 4 as he's writing about the death, there's the cross, the burial, and the resurrection, he says Jesus was buried and that he rose again the third day, notice, according to the scriptures. I need to pause here just long enough to emphasize that you have, I have some religious friends and neighbors and loved ones who believe that Jesus' original intent in coming was to establish an earthly kingdom and dispensational premillennialism teaches that uh, he was unexpectedly rejected and had to go to plan B, like a quarterback at the line of scrimmage who sees that the defense is ready for the play called in the huddle. Now what are we going to do? They're ready for us. Let's audible. Let's change to a different play. And there are some who want you and me to believe that someday Jesus is coming back to start the kingdom he never got to start because he was, quote, unexpectedly rejected. Well, here's a question that I think all of us would do well to ask and answer. If he really meant to set it up the first time but was unexpectedly rejected from so doing... What's to keep them from unexpectedly being rejected again the next time he tries it? 
Truth be told, Jesus didn't fail in his mission to set up his kingdom. His kingdom's not of this world, and some still have trouble understanding that, John 18, 36. He established his kingdom, and his resurrection was a very important part of that. The gates of Hades will not prevail against my promise to build my church. And the gates of hell, Hades, the literal word, did not keep him in the grave and stop him from rising and stop him from ascending and stop him from being crowned. The coronation of Jesus as king of kings is there in Acts chapter 2. Now, that raises a question, though. Okay, you've claimed that Jesus rose from the dead, but can you prove it? And you know, it's one thing to claim something, it's another to prove it. Let me give you an illustration. I stand before you tonight to make the following claim. I am the world's most efficient and effective and greatest handyman. I can promise you if my wife and children were here, they'd be laughing themselves silly. That is crazy. My mom and dad bought my wife a tool set for Christmas one year. They bought it for her. They knew I wouldn't know what to do with it. That's sad, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, they bought it for her. So if I claim to be a handyman, that's, that's a claim that cannot be substantiated by the evidence. Jesus said, I am, what are you, Jesus? I am the resurrection and the life. Can you prove that? Can you substantiate that claim? Oh, yes. He did substantiate it by the empty tomb. Now, here's the bottom line. The tomb in which the dead body of Jesus was placed is either still occupied by his remains or it's empty. And if it's empty, how did it get that way? And that's what we're addressing right now. Either he arose as he predicted, miraculously arose from the dead just as predicted, or it was removed from the tomb in some other way because the tomb where Jesus was placed is definitely empty, but how did it get that way? There are skeptics who want to present all kinds of outlandish explanations for how the tomb got empty. And here's the number one theory, and it started early in the first century. Look at Matthew chapter 28. Here's the number one explanation for what happened to the dead body of Jesus after it was put in the tomb. Here's the number one explanation for what happened to him. Matthew chapter 28 And verse number 11, now when they were going, behold, some of the watch, that's the guard, came into the city. They showed to the chief priests all the things that were done, the things that had just happened in the earlier part of this chapter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They came into the city to tell about how the tomb was empty. And you'll note when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. It's a bribe. We'll pay you this money if you'll say, what do you, what do you want us to say for this money? We want you to say this. Verse 13, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Now, wait a minute. There were 18 offenses for which a Roman guard could be put to death, and falling asleep on the job was one of those 18. If we go around saying while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole his body, the governor may hear that and want to put us to death. They said, well, we've got that covered. If this comes to the governor's ears, verse 14, we'll persuade him and secure you. We'll make sure you don't die. We'll tell him that we paid you to say this, that you really didn't do it. So they took the money. Verse 15, did as they were taught. And watch this. Matthew twenty-eight fifteen. At the time Matthew wrote this gospel record, He said this, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. The idea that the disciples stole his body while the Roman guards slept is the first theory that was spread as to how the tomb got empty. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. I want you to notice, first of all, the Jewish authorities did not deny that the tomb was empty. They knew it was empty. They just needed to come up with a cover-up explanation as to how it got that way. 
They knew it didn't happen the way they claimed it did, so they had to bribe people to lie about it and say that it happened that way. Every burial site that the Roman guards would guard, and there were usually 15 to 20 Roman guards at each place they would guard, they would attach the Roman seal. You break that seal, that's considered vandalization that would cost you your life. And so this is something they would do, by the way, they would change guard units every six hours. And so you tell me, what are the chances that 15 to 20 separate guards who are only on six hour shifts could all be so thoroughly asleep that the disciples would be able to come in and to move a stone that weighed 2,000 pounds or more? to roll it out of its rut and to get in there and to have the time to unwrap Jesus from his burial clothes, his grave clothes, and then to have time to fold it all up neatly and, and, and keep it in there. No, when thieves come in to take stuff, they don't stick around to clean up after they've messed up. They, they get out. And this is preposterous anyway, because do you remember what the disciples did according to Mark 14, 50 on the night Jesus was betrayed? They, how many? They all forsook him and fled. Every one of the disciples ran like scared rabbits. They all forsook him and fled, at least initially. And then, of course, John is there later near the cross but the original intent was all of them left. And then you read about Peter getting a little closer, but that's another story for another time. Here's the bottom line. Let me ask you, did the apostles on the night they ran that Jesus was betrayed suddenly muster up enough courage to say, hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to go and take on a guard of Romans, Roman battalion of guards. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, let's try to steal him while they're sleeping, but what if they wake up? Well, let's, let's just fight. They were running on the night Jesus was betrayed. It is not, it is not logic, logical to suggest that suddenly they summon the courage to do something different. And furthermore, let me ask you, what would your testimony be if someone accused you of stealing something they love while they were asleep. And this is back in the days, by the way, there were no video cameras positioned outside the tomb to keep a running footage of who was there. No, this was something that was unverifiable. Their claim was, while we were asleep, so sound asleep that none of us woke up, the disciples came and stole the body. Whoa, 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 whoa. If I said, while I was asleep, Ricky Berger came and stole my golf clubs, now, I know Ricky enough, better, well enough to know he's not going to do that. But listen, I don't even know if he plays golf. He may play better than I do. Maybe I should just give him my clubs. But here's the bottom line. If I say he did it while I was sleeping, what would his defense attorney cross-examine me by asking the very first question? Um, if you were asleep, how do you know it was Ricky? Well, I just know. No, that's not going to work. If you're asleep, you can't accuse someone of stealing something while you're asleep because if you're asleep, you don't know who did it if something truly is missing and something stolen from you. And so this idea that the disciples stole the body, look, if that's true, arrest the disciples and put them on trial. They didn't do that. Why? Because they didn't have the evidence to convict them. And they knew the real truth, by the way. So the disciples did not even understand the importance of the resurrection completely until after it happened. So why would they be motivated to steal his dead body? What's that going to get them? Okay, now we'll go around and say he arose from the dead. And let me ask you, what did going around preaching the resurrection of Jesus get the apostles? It got them what? persecution. It got them all kinds of pain and suffering and sorrow. It didn't get them rich. And don't you think one of them, at least one of them would have cracked at some point and said, okay, okay, I admit it. We stole the body and we dumped it in a pit somewhere. 
No, none of them did that because they didn't have the body. And that raises the second uh, possible a suggestion that we hear, oh, no, no, the disciples didn't steal the body. The enemies of Jesus stole the body. Okay, that's, that's preposterous for this reason. What did the enemies of Jesus not want the apostles to preach anymore? Look at Acts chapter 4 and notice one statement that uh, is so absolutely crystal clear that it's ungetaroundable. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 2 they're talking to the people, the priests, the captain, the Sadducees. They came upon them. Notice verse 2. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus, what? The resurrection from the dead. So wait a minute. If the enemy stole the body, they would know where they put it. And if these apostles are going around telling everyone, he arose, he arose, and the enemies of Jesus know, uh, no, he didn't. We know where his body is. We're the ones who stole it. All they would have had to do is wheel the dead body of Jesus down the streets of Jerusalem and say, here's your risen Savior, and it would have snuffed Christianity out in its cradle. Why didn't the enemies of Jesus produce the dead body of Jesus? Because they didn't have it. The apostles didn't have it. The enemies of Jesus did not have it. Well, that raises another question. Some say, okay, well, Joseph of Arimathea must have taken it. You know, it was his tomb. Okay, let's reason through this. There's not a shred of historical evidence in the scriptures that suggest Joseph of Arimathea would have stolen the body of Jesus from his tomb and take it and put it somewhere else. So where is the historical documentation that Joseph of Arimathea did it? There isn't any. And why would he have done it? What would have been the necessity? of? Well, he wanted to, his borrowed tomb back for himself, okay? Then wouldn't he have known that the, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead? Yes, he would have if he's the one that moved the dead body. When the resurrection of Jesus started being preached, he would have said, Whoa, not so fast. I know where the body is because I'm the one who went and got it and moved it. Joseph of Arimathea did not ever say, Hey, listen, uh... I'm the one that took it. In fact, I want you to notice a passage in Mark 15, 43 that tells us something about the character of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea, what are you like? In Mark chapter 15, verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor. He also waited for the kingdom of God. He came, he went in boldly to Pilate, craved the body of Jesus, and they, they actually gave it to Joseph in verse 45. Would you notice the statement that is made in Luke 23 and verse 50? What kind of man is Joseph of Arimathea? Is he the kind that would lie and steal? In Luke 23 and verse 50, behold, there was a man named Joseph, this is Joseph of Arimathea, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. That's him. Joseph of Arimathea did not take the body of Jesus and hide it somewhere and then keep it hushed when everyone was saying he arose from the dead. That would be dishonorable. Now, there's another theory, and that is the wrong tomb. Well, it's obvious what happened. Uh, Kersop Lake was a doctor who said, uh, yeah, I know what happened. These women were blinded by their grief, the tears of their weeping, and they accidentally went to the wrong tomb looking for the dead body of Jesus that they were going to anoint, you remember, with spices. They, they accidentally went to the wrong tomb, and when they got to that tomb and it was open, they, they were told he's not here, and they thought, well, that meant he was risen. And so they erroneously concluded that Jesus arose from the dead because they accidentally went to the wrong tomb. Okay, that would mean everyone would have had to go to the wrong tomb. Peter and John ran to the tomb. They would have had to run to the wrong tomb. The Roman guards would have had to guard the wrong tomb. 
for this theory to be true because if the dead body of Jesus was still in the correct tomb where the Roman guards were, then all they have to do is produce the body. The Roman guards were lying about what happened because they didn't have the body. And furthermore, when you think about uh, this wrong tomb theory, uh, what about Joseph of Arimathea? Did he not know where his own tomb was? Did he accidentally put Jesus in the wrong place? Or once this was being said that he was risen from the dead, all Joseph of Arimathea had to do was go and say, no, no, he's, he's still there. You obviously went to the wrong tomb. You never see Joseph of Arimathea saying that. Well, that leads to another theory, the pit theory. There is a, a skeptical professor who said, the body of Jesus was more likely thrown into a pit than it was given a chance to be laid in a new tomb. Based on what, Mr. Skeptical Professor? You're basing this on what? He has no evidence. He's just assuming that uh, they threw him in a pit. And there's not a shred of evidence to suggest that that happened. And besides that, let's just take this argument a little bit further. If they threw the dead body of Jesus into a pit and no one knew where it was, that still doesn't explain the appearances. Here Jesus appears to his apostles. Then he appears, according to 1 Corinthians 15, to about 500 people at the same time. And then he appeared, of course, to, you see, Martha and Mary, I mean, in John 20. You see, all these appearances that Jesus had over a period of time, and Saul of Tarsus, why was Saul of Tarsus suddenly changed from persecuting believers to being a persecuted believer himself? What happened? He saw something significant that changed his life and completely revolutionized his thinking. And I guarantee you, it wasn't based on some legend that Jesus had been, you know, raised from the dead. He saw him. He saw the Lord on the road to Damascus and knew that he was risen from the dead. The appearances are absolutely critical to this. And then there's this uh, swoon theory. There was a German rationalist by the name of Venturini in the 18th century who actually said the following, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He just appeared to die. He fainted from the loss of fluids and exhaustion, and they took his body down thinking he was dead. And then they wrapped him in his grave clothes and put him in the tomb, and the cold, damp tomb revived him. And according to this theory, Jesus was then able to extricate himself from the grave clothes, which, by the way, historically would have included 100 pounds worth of burial spices and, and grave clothes. These, this was what was commonly done. And so according to this theory, Jesus would have, in an extremely wounded condition, have fought himself out of the grave clothes. Okay, let's say he gets that far. Now he's got a problem. There's this stone rolled up against the mouth of the tomb and no single man can move it if he's just a human being. Not a single man can, can move that by himself. But according to this, even though he'd been on the cross for six hours and beaten and scourged before that, and before that in the Garden of Gethsemane had, had sweat that was his blood, according to this, even though he was so wounded in all of those ways, he somehow was able to move that stone, fight off the Roman battalion of guards, and walk on wounded feet about seven miles to present himself as the, ascent, as the risen Lord of Lords. You know, there's a skeptic by the name of David Strauss. He doesn't believe, but even he said the following about this theory. He said... It's impossible that a being who has stolen half dead out of the sepulcher, who crept about weak and ill, wanting and needing medical treatment, who required bandaging, strengthening, and indulgence, 
and who still at last yielded to his sufferings could have given to his disciples the impression that he was a conqueror over death in the grave. Such a resuscitation could only have weakened the impression which he'd made upon them in life and death. At the most, could only have given it an elegaic voice, but could by no possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm or have elevated their reverence into worship. And by the way, if you'll note Mark 15, 45 with me, Mark chapter 15 and verse 45 you will observe that Pilate would not even release the body until the death had been confirmed. Mark 15, 45. Verse 44, actually. Pilate marvels and says, he's already dead? And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him. He's trying to confirm, is he really dead? He asked him whether he had been dead any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, when he got the confirmation that he was truly dead, that's when he turned the body over to Joseph. So there was a check made before the body was transferred into Joseph's possession to make sure that he was truly dead. And you remember these soldiers were trained when they came to Jesus Normally, they would break the legs of crucifixion victims to keep them from pushing up to get life-giving breath. And they needed to go ahead and end the process so they'd break their legs. They didn't break the legs of Jesus, according to John 19 and verse number 31. Why not? Because they saw, verse 33, that he was dead already. They didn't break his legs. And then one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced him in the side and blood and water came gushing out. Further confirmation that he's really dead. He's not just seriously wounded. He is dead. So this swoon theory, one writer said this would almost be more miraculous than the resurrection itself for this to be true. Oh, then there's the hallucination theory. They all just thought they saw him. They didn't really see him. They just thought they did. It's like having a vivid dream where you think, oh, I really thought they were standing there, but I woke up and realized, no, it was just a dream. That's what they're claiming, these appearances that you and I... Re okay, let me ask you this question. How do you get 500 people or more? In fact, if you'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, you'll notice the statement that Paul makes here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit... He says in verse number 6, after that, Jesus was seen of above 500 brethren at once, at the same time. How do you get 500 plus people to have the same exact hallucination at the same exact moment? You don't. And so this is not, this is not some kind of sham. This is literally... Jesus Christ having been raised from the dead. And you remember Thomas uh, wanted to touch and feel and he was allowed to do so and saw that Jesus was truly risen from the dead, Luke 24, 37 and John 20, 24 to 29. And Thomas, did Thomas just reach out and touch a vision? Or did he reach out and touch an actual substantive body? He knew he was raised from the dead. And friends, you and I can know the same. And so that is why I'm privileged tonight to be a proclaimer of the resurrection. We've seen the predictions of it. We've seen the proof of it. And now the proclamation of it on the day of Pentecost. Here's what Peter said. This Jesus has God raised up of whom we are all witnesses, Acts 2.32. In Acts 5 and verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Acts 10 and verse 40 at the household of Cornelius. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. The resurrection is always followed by appearances. Those things go hand in hand in Scripture. And listen to Acts 13, 29 and 30. When they'd fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. Now that brings me to the final observation, and that is what profit is there in the resurrection for you and for me? 
What difference does it make whether Jesus rose from the dead or not? Number one, it gives us assurance that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God. Let me ask you this question. Was Jesus the first person to ever be raised from the dead in the whole Bible? No. You see a prophet raising a boy from the dead in the Old Testament and handing him to his mother. You see Jesus himself raising people from the dead before he ever died. He stood at the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. And even though Lazarus had been dead four days, here he comes. And many believed on Jesus because of this. And the chief priests could not deny that Lazarus was raised from the dead. In fact, their solution, let's kill Lazarus. We don't want him walking around as a walking billboard for the deity of Christ. Let's kill Lazarus. What has he ever done to you? He's making people believe in Jesus, and we can't stand that. Wow. The prophet of the resurrection is that I know Jesus really is who he claimed to be. Because he was raised from the dead to die no more. Romans 6, 9, he will never die. He did not die again. Lazarus was raised from the dead. He died again. All those resurrections we read about in the Old and New Testaments that were not the resurrection of Jesus, those people all died again. Jesus never did. And thus, you and I can face death with courage and wisdom and strength and know that it's going to be all right. It gives us a foundation for our faith. Paul would put it like this in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ be not risen from the dead, your faith is vain and you're yet in your sins. That's how big a deal it is. If Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, let's all go home. There's nothing to stay here for if he did not rise from the dead. It gives us the hope of salvation. There's one phrase in Romans 4.25 I'd like you to notice. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible says in verse 24 leading up to this, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and watch this, was raised again, why was he raised? Was raised again for our justification. You and I could not be justified apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If there's still a tomb in Jerusalem where the body of Jesus is still housed, then you and I are still in our sins and we have no hope. And nothing else matters. But if Jesus rose from the dead, as the Bible says he did, then only that matters when it comes to the final scheme of things. This gives us certainty about our own future resurrection. Let me close out the class session by saying this. On March the 4th of 2016, my mother who lived with me and my wife and my dad all lived in the same house. My dad still lives with us. On March the 4th of 2016, my mother walked out into the living room and said to my dad, Ted, I can't breathe. And then she went back into her bedroom and we followed her. And she would stand up and then she would sit down and then she would stand up and then she would sit down. And I said, Mom, are you having a panic attack? And she said, No, I'm dying. And I didn't think she really was. I just thought she thought she was. But within two minutes after she said that, even though we tried to administer CPR and everything there was that we could do. She was gone, just like that. I know I'm not the only one here that's faced circumstances similar to that. So I'm standing at her graveside preaching her funeral. And I remembered something. And I said, my mother has already been buried and already been raised. And that makes this more manageable. Some years ago, my mother was buried in a watery grave of baptism. And she came forth 
to walk in newness of life as a penitent, confessing believer who'd been baptized. And I'm standing here at her grave site today with hope because this burial doesn't frighten me, doesn't frighten the Christian because we're already buried and raised. And so we know this burial is just not the end, it's a means to an end. Someday my mother's going to be raised from this very spot and have a new body that will never get sick. And that's true for all of us. And it's only true because he arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose.